Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Six. Boy, there's a lot going on. I tried to cram all of it in my uh, my newsletter this morning. You have uh, Trump's big, not really, lawsuit against Facebook, which is really is just kind of a fundraising scam. But you knew that. Um, the right's sudden fascination and enthusiasm for cameras in the classroom, uh, which is an interesting twist here. Uh, surge in the happiness index, according to uh, Gallup, and of course, uh, we continue to have the, uh, the 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 pratfall of this this new website that Jason Miller created. Is it, is it pronounced Getter? I don't know. Matt, Matt Lewis from the Daily Beast joins me. Matt, is it pronounced Getter? How do we how, how do we pronounce that? I'm calling it Getter. Getter, yeah, Getter. Not not going not going well. So there's there's a lot I want to talk about, including your piece. About J.D. Vance being the avatar of corruption in the GOP. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the New York City election and all of this stuff. I want to talk about this amazing anti-vaxxer surge um, on Fox News and Charlie Kirk and all of these guys. But but, but I, I, I did want to comment on one thing, which is this ongoing evolution of Trumpian January 6th trutherism. And, you know, we've gone from it was Antifa, it wasn't our people, to, okay, it was our people, but it wasn't that bad. They were peaceful t- uh, t- tourists. And then it sort of became, it was an inside job by the FBI. And then it was sort of like, what insurrection? We're just going to forget about it. This latest development, though, is is interesting. And I would like your thoughts on this. Trump now embracing this whole protesters as martyr narrative. Uh, I think Jonathan Chait had a really good piece, you know, the the chilling message of Trump's embrace of the Ashley uh, Babbitt martyrdom. What he's basically saying is January 6th is now this heroic uprising for the movement. I mean, it's sort of gone along from, okay, it was terrible. We deplore it to, no, this was this was this heroic culmination of a righteous uprising. And I'm I just got the sense we're going to be hearing this this, you know, who shot Ashley Babbitt thing. And, and here's the little soundbite from uh, I, I feel I need to apologize for this. Ah, nah. Marjorie Taylor Greene, who went on. What, what was she on here? Newsmax um, saying that she would have been really good friends with Ashley Babbitt because she was this passionate patriot. And she really kind of compares Ashley Babbitt to the murder you know, to George Floyd. Uh, let's play the sound bite of Marjorie Taylor Greene. Ashley Babbitt, sometime, somehow I, she, you two, I think, would have been friends. Oh, God. I, I'm sure we would have. She seems like she was a very passionate patriot and a very proud Trump supporter, which I really appreciate that. And she was also a veteran. So I'm thankful for her service to the country. I've already been speaking about Ashley Babbitt. I've also also, um, met with her attorneys as well. And I think it's very important for her family to know who killed her, because if they if this country can demand justice for someone like George Floyd, then we can certainly demand justice for Ashley Babbitt. And everyone deserves to know who killed her, not just seeing a gun and a hand on a video clip. But we need to know who it is. And and this is also why, I'm, you know, I've been against the January 6th commission and the committee that Nancy Pelosi wants to carry forward. She just wants a witch hunt. But I'm more than willing to serve on that committee to stand up for uh, for President Trump, for all Republicans in Congress and to stop the witch hunt, but also to demand answers like Ashley Babbitt, who killed her. So this is interesting, isn't it, Matt? I mean, we've gone the full circle now around from where that was really terrible to, you know what? They were heroes. They were <laughs> they were they were martyrs. And those cops, what bastards they killed innocent, heroic Ashley Babbitt, who would have been hanging out and doing stuff with Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing. You know, Christian Vanderbrook yesterday had a tweet where he was talking about the you know, the evolving narratives, right, about, oh, these were just people having a picnic, they were hugging each other, uh, you know, to, I guess, maybe now they're heroes, you know, it keeps changing. Um, You know, and I said, like, well, in in fairness, January 6th wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for, like, Italian satellites and North Koreans who snuck through the main harbor. (laughs) And, of course, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. And, of course, don't forget the Chinese bamboo. The bamboo ballots, yeah. 
So, you know, I think part of it is throw whatever you can against the wall and, and see what narrative sticks. Some of these are obviously like mutually exclusive theories. Oh, I forgot about the fact that it was actually Antifa, right? right? right. That was the, was, that was the know, beginning. That's, that's, that's the other one. Yeah. Um, but look, I mean, obviously, I think what's happening is that revolutions need martyrs. And uh, ironically, Ashley Babbitt, I guess, is becoming that. Um, somebody pointed out on Twitter that, you know, George Floyd was like allegedly trying to pass off like counterfeit $20 bills. That was his crime that got him killed. Ashley Babbitt was, you know, in the middle of an insurrection that was like trying to murder the vice president. Um, and so I'm not sure not that, that you know, equivalent, the yeah. perfect analogy that they want. No. And, and of course, these are mutually contradictory, but I think we've seen the ability of certain folks to hold completely contradictory ideas in their head at the same time. And I'm trying to remember that sort of, you know, decision matrix about uh, how people would defend Trump. This goes back to, I think, to 2017. You know, they, he didn't say it. it. It's not true. OK, it may be true, but this is misinterpreted to, OK, he said it. Um, we're going to ignore it. No, he said it and he's completely right. I mean, it's interesting how this sort of evolution and I just wonder how how widespread it's going to be now. The the complete embrace that uh, January six was 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 righteous, and these people are martyrs. You can see it's it's been percolating for a while, and even Trump has pushed this, and Vladimir Putin was citing it. You know, these poor political martyrs who are being held in prison, and this is just awful. Um, I don't know. Speaking of strange uh, devolutions, I am really struck by how aggressively the conservative media has gone on the anti-vaxxer thing. I mean, it is just, it, within the last 24 hours, you got Candace Owen, not one person in my family will ever touch the COVID vaccine, uh, vac COVID-19 vaccine. That's a decision we have made unabashedly as a family. Medical freedom is an individual right that should never, all caps, be infringed upon. Any person who thinks otherwise has no place in our government. I'm not sure who thinks of mandatory uh, vaccine, but anyway. Um, Fox host. The host of this, the focus of this administration on vaccines is mind boggling, really. Yeah. Charlie Kirk comparing vaccination guidelines to apartheid. Uh, let's see here. Here's a Laura Ingram show. Fox News warns that anybody under the age of 30 should not get the vaccine. And then they, of course, then attack the left and Fauci for being pro vaccine. I don't know, Matt. I, I mean, I understand the individual choice thing, but given the spread of the the variant, the Delta variant, uh, and the danger that this this still poses, it just seems so weird that that this has become such a thing on the right, especially because, I mean, in an alternative reality, they could give Trump credit for this vaccine, right? So, right. And in fact, in an alternative reality, they do. This is another example of how there are really two narratives here. Every once in a while, somebody says, hey, uh, you know, in fact, I think there was a piece uh, in the Washington Post by a conservative saying like, hey, Donald Trump gets credit, should get credit for Operation Warp Speed. I think it was Mark Thiessen, Thiessen former Bush speechwriter, basically said uh, Joe Biden is making a mistake. It's Joe Biden's fault. He should be Joe Biden should be giving Donald Trump credit because Trump is actually the one behind Operation Warp Speed. He's the one who made this miracle of Western civilization, you know, the vaccine uh, possible. And so th that narrative is out there. But I clearly clearly it's not the dominant narrative. The dominant narrative now is this culture war against vaccines, which I think is really insane. Um, something like what is it like 96 percent of the people who are now dying from COVID are people who were not vaccinated, which is exactly what you would expect based on uh, what we were told about the vaccine, uh, the, the amount of protection that it would uh, provide. I think you would have to be um, pretty stupid at this point if, if not to get a vaccine. Other people in other countries can't get it. America, we're like, we'll give you a gun. I mean, Charlie, I live in West yeah. Virginia. We're like, literally like, We'll give you guns. We'll give you money if you get a vaccine. Like we are begging people we'll give you to get pot. a vaccine. And now the latest thing, which I really is angering me, is, you know, there's a talk about going door to door in like rural communities to try to like encourage people to get vaccinated and maybe even do it right there. And there are conservatives now, including Dan Crenshaw, who are basically, you know, making a big stink about this. And like this is 
like somehow this is like a Nazi, you know, thing uh, that, that we're going to be encouraging people to actually vaccinate themselves against a deadly virus. So what it's, is with Dan Crenshaw? That's a really good point because Dan Crenshaw is, I always get blowback when I say this, but he, but he's a smart guy. He's an intelligent guy. He know he knows what's actually going on. You're basically, it's like, you know, the welcome wagon. It's like the Jehovah's Witnesses. You're knocking on people's doors. You're offering them something. You're not kicking down their doors and forcing them at gunpoint. <laughs> this is not a forceful thing. This is an outreach program. People go door to door. I'm guessing that Dan Crenshaw went door to door when he was running for office. Politicians do this all the freaking time. And yet he's decided that he's going to play this card that somehow there's something threatening and ominous about this. Yeah. So, I mean, he, and by the way, I mean, door to door campaigning is probably the most effective yes. sort of campaigning you can do yeah. because it's it's personal and, and 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 there's a lot of reasons. And I think that if, you know, Joe Biden's at like, we're, we're at like a what, 67 percent, you know, Close, yeah. uh, have had one shot and and didn't didn't reach the target of 70 percent. And this is like a good way to try to bump up those numbers. I mean, I do think it would be awesome if Donald Trump actually would come out in favor and encourage people and maybe take, try to take credit. That's on that's on Donald Trump to do that. Um, I think the door to door thing is a good idea. And yeah. not only are people like Dan Crenshaw uh, discouraging people from getting vaccines, which is a life and death thing. But I think they're actually jeopardizing the safety of, you know, people who may be going door to door. Yes. Trying to vaccinate people. It's a very serious thing. And look, hmm. and I've written off I've written off Dan Crenshaw. I, I don't think we can write off everybody who wasn't always with us the whole time. Right. Because like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger didn't vote for the first. I don't think they voted for the first no, impeachment, which I think not. Trump Trump was like guilty as sin and should have been impeached the first time. But I don't think we can like hold everybody permanently accountable because there'll be like be nobody left. Um, having said that, I think that Crenshaw has demonstrated many, many, many times that uh, the degree to which he sounds uh, occasionally serious and competent is like more the exception uh, than, than the standard. He always will revert back to this um, sort of, of demagogic politics. And um, I, I know that there are other people sort of in our, in our uh, lane, Charlie, who, who are really hoping that he becomes a, like a voice for, for good. I just don't think it's going to happen. And then yeah. the last thing I'll say before I shut up is the other really disappointing thing about him, I think, is that he's a Navy SEAL. I mean, you would think that someone who can go through the sort of training that they go through, if you listen to McRaven's speech, that commencement speech at 2014 at UT, famously about how to make your bed or why you should make your bed every morning, the 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 training that they go through is, is, is grueling and not just physically grueling. I mean, their whole goal is to get you to quit the training. Right. It's like, I think, six months at Coronado. So someone who goes through that, you would think – would have like the honor, honor, courage, and commitment that you would want for a politician, but apparently it doesn't translate to political courage. No, and and it's you know I I, I wonder whether it's even a matter of cowardice or courage, or or whether it's just sort of the dopamine hit of being part of this tribe. Uh, what you have to say to be accepted, what you have to say to be the rock star, of uh, getting the positive feedback, because I I was actually reading an article in American Greatness. I may write something about it where. It's which is a super uh, Trumpy publication, but they're kind of pointing out all of Trump's failings and what he didn't accomplish, how he didn't destroy the oligarchy. And it, it does occur to me that, yes, we have a cult of personality, but we've also sort of launched this vortex of of weirdness and extremism. Uh, of alienation and permanent anger. I mean, you know, you've been writing about this for years, the, the grievance industries out there. And at some point they become self-perpetuating. And it has nothing to do with Donald Trump. I mean, they were there, the grievance industries were there before Trump and they're going to be there after Trump. So um, obviously we live in a world where it's uh, it's springtime for demagogues. And yeah. so well, what a surprise. If all of the incentive structures encourage demagoguery, why should we be surprised when we uh, have, you know, hot and cold running demagogues? Here's the other here's the other problem, Charlie. And I look, I'm a fan of the Electoral College um, on principle. I'm a fan of, you know, 
I'm not concerned that North Dakota has two senators just like California. Like I'm 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 down with that. However, what has happened because this system is right now rigged toward the Republican Party? It we really don't have a free market of ideas. No. You know, like in an in a, in a normal world, like in, in in a free market, if you were putting forward you know crazy ideas that could not get a majority of support in this country politically, you would have, you would be forced to change or lose, right? And so there would be that immediate feedback mechanism that tells you, hey, you've gone too far. You better readjust, recalibrate. Um, instead, we have like, I guess what you would call maybe like a resource curse, yeah. you know, um, where Republicans don't actually have to respond to the free market warning signs. And in a sense, it's sort of like protectionism. This is a very good so point. This, the system now is 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 allowing them to create an inefficient, inferior product and not actually uh, have to lose elections because of it. You know, I, I didn't know that I was going to get to this, um, but let me just play this very, very short uh, soundbite, which you've heard and you've probably commented on. Uh, Chip Roy, who is a Texas congressman who has had these spasms of good sense, but has been drawn into this vortex as well, is caught on tape. I think he's talking to some fundraising group or some think tank. I'm not even sure what it was. Uh, but uh, Ch Chip Roy talking about how, you know, the goal of the Republican Party is just to stop anything from happening, complete obstructionism. Let me just play a very, very short clip of, uh, of Congressman Chip Roy. Honestly, right now, for the next 18 months, our job is to do everything we can to slow all of that down to get to December of 2022 and then get in, get in, in here and leave. Yeah, I mean, and he goes on saying, you know, we want to have create chaos. And I was asked about this, you know, last night, and I said, there's absolutely nothing surprising about that. Absolutely not. This is exactly what the base wants to hear. This is their position. They've staked out that, you know, the whole owning the libs and trolling culture is all about obstruction and creating chaos. It's not, they don't even pretend that they're trying to solve these problems in the real world. And it's interesting because he was talking about infrastructure and I had a tasteless thought, if you'll indulge me for a moment. I'm trying to imagine a meeting of the condominium association at a certain Florida condominium. The people who would argue, we don't need to spend any money on repairs. We don't need to do that. Were these fiscal conservatives? Were these responsible people? What, what, what would we do to describe the people who actually actively obstructed fixing that condominium. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. just, I, and, and, there, and there's, I mean, there's a lot to that. Um, including like, uh, who are these experts to tell us? Yeah. Like what? I, I can't, that's fake news, man. I don't, you know, you, these so-called experts coming in telling us that my building, you, you think you know more about my building than I do? You know? Yeah. It's, um, uh, there's something there, Charlie. Well, and again, to your, to your, to your point though, is that Chip Roy knows that they will pay given the, you know, the, the redistricting and the and, and, and the and the imbalance in the United States Senate and everything, he knows that he will pay no political price for the complete obstruction of of this. Even though, you know, I, I think the majority of people would actually like to like have roads fixed and bridges fixed and all these other things. I want to move on to a couple of other things, including and I want to get to the you know the Biden coalition. And I want to get to, you, to to J.D. Vance. I was reading a piece by um, Rudy Texera. Is that how you pronounce it? Um, who 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 I who I think is is a man after your own heart, even though he is a liberal. You're not. Um, it's a is it re Roy? Oh, I'm, I, I apologize in advance. <laughs> but but he has a um, he has a, a newsletter called the Liberal Patriot. He's a liberal Democrat, but he understands the problems of the coalition. He has a piece saying why the current Democratic strategy probably won't work. The Biden boom's not enough. He says, you know, this the Democrats are betting on economics and healthcare to, uh, you know, break the, the you know, midterm curse. But he says it's not going to be enough to tilt the playing field decisively. To do that, they will need to overcome suspicions of the party that have to do with other more culturally inflected concerns that in turn will require the party to take some stances that the ascendant left in the party will likely oppose for ideological reasons. And the number one issue he cites is crime. 
that at this point, you know, whatever you you want to cite, uh, you want to cite the, the statistics. Um, more and more Americans are thinking this is a major crisis. It's happening under Joe Biden's watch. Um, there is a suspicion that the Democrats don't get it. That Eric Adams' victory in New York City Democratic mayoral primary should really have been a dramatic signal to the Democratic Party about how they should me should message. But I'm not sure that they will fully take it on board. What are your thoughts? I know you've talked about this. You talked with uh, Josh Kroshauer the other day on your podcast about this. Uh, yeah, no, I wrote a piece, Charlie, back in March saying Biden had it right on crime in 1993. <laughs> now he's in trouble. And I went on to say, you know, if violent crime rates keep rising like they have over the last year, it will reaffirm long held stereotypes about bleeding heart liberalism. And I think that's true. I mean, it's not really fair. The crime, the violent crime rate, which is the, the problem right now, has actually been rising before Biden got elected. But it's happening on his watch. And I think for a Democrat, if this starts to spiral out of control, um, on his watch, it would just sort of reinforce those stereotypes. And, you know, there's also st stuff like the critical race theory happening in schools, uh, Afghanistan, which I, you know, I'm with, I'm with uh, Bill Crystal on this one. I, I think it's a, a big mistake to sort of follow after Donald Trump, you know, with negotiating with the Taliban and, and, and withdrawing over there. I think it's a mistake and who knows how that's going to go. But, um, Joe Biden may just be immune to some of this, right? He's Teflon. He just keeps like eating ice cream cones and God love him. Every, I just, I love to see the man, mm -hmm. you know, just having a good time. And he's so likable. I like Joe Biden. I just wonder if like Biden is replicable. Like Biden is sort of special. He, for some reason, he gets a pass on all of this. But like, what about the midterms? Or what about whoever, is there a Democrat who could succeed Joe Biden, who could get away with these really brewing problems that are happening right now, many of which are actually not Biden's fault, some of which may be. Um, Biden may not pay the price, but I just I don't think Democrats fully appreciate because, you know, look, you look at it, and you're like, Donald Trump was such a joke. The Republican Party is such a mess. Democrats should should have a pretty easy ride, but but actually they're not gonna. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I was writing down some of the, the major challenges faced by the Biden administration right now. And obviously, number one is crime. Uh, number two would be inflation if it actually does rear its head. Um, race. Uh, then you get to issues like uh, whether he's standing up to Russia on the hacking and Afghanistan. Now, I, I, I guess I'm more on the and I kind of surprised myself on this uh, more dovish end on Afghanistan. I'm just sick of the war. I'm just I'm sick of the endless war. And I think that our our uh, our appetite for that has been completely exhausted. On the other hand, if, in fact, the Taliban do, um, as they appear to be in the process of uh, overrun Afghanistan, we're going to have some horrible uh, imagery. Yeah. And and I, I, I'm I, curious, about, but I, I'm curious yeah. about the sick of the war, th war well, thing, because like. Does it feel like, I mean, if I'd asked you, I mean, now it kind of does because people are talking about Afghanistan, but six months ago or a year ago, did it even feel like we were at war? It seems no. to me that we had a kind of settled things down. We had like a, a, a large enough reserve force in Afghanistan to keep things from spiraling out of control. Um, and we weren't really suffering many casualties. I personally wouldn't have a problem with doing that in perpetuity. And I know some people will freak out when I say that, but like we've got people in, you know, in South Korea, Korea we've got people Europe. in Europe. Okay, well, I, that, I don't that, see that why would be an analogy. I guess part of it was, um, you, you know, I, I remember watching uh, the movie based on Jake Tapper's book, which is a real story, and watching these American soldiers being pinned down in this, uh, this uh, stupidly located uh, base. And I think part of it is just the futility of it. Like, why are we there? Why? I mean, what 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 is the point? You know, you make a point about the just holding things in in stasis. But um, I guess the point I was trying to make is I I am I understand that that if you polled it today, I think a, a strong majority of Americans would support the decision to get out of Afghanistan. But if in fact it does fall apart, it will contribute. The optics will contribute to a sense of weakness and defeat and and uh, and and retreat. And I think that hurts. And I, I, I think the danger for, for, for Biden is that while people like him, 
there is that nagging concern that he is old and Kamala Harris is unready. So the old and unready, and perhaps there are other forces out there. That's the that's the narrative which you keep hearing. And so those are the real dangers, you know, crime, inflation, the culture war stuff, race, a uh, sense of, of, of weakness. Now, a- again, the counter to that is there's this new Gallup poll showing us that, that, that Americans are kind of happy that we're feeling we're thriving, that we're kind of coming back. So I, I, I go back and forth between thinking, you know, we maybe spend too much, and I mean you and me here, <laughs> spend too mm-hmm. much time, you know, listening to the cable talking heads and uh, looking at the at, at the punditry and looking at at Twitter, and, and in which things are very very complicated. When in the real world, things are actually not going that badly. I mean, is there possibly a a disconnect there? Oh yeah, and I have to say, I mean, to be honest, um, I'm personally torn quite often about this. And, um, I live my, I live a happy life. I I don't, I don't sit around worrying about inflation or crime, um, except for professionally, you know what I'm saying? But, but there's certainly a part of Biden that I find really refreshing and really likable. And, um, then I see the left doing things that really concern me. And, and so I would say with my writing, um, I really view it as like sincerely, I view it as like constructive criticism. Like my goal is not to tear down Biden no. just so another Republican like Trump could get elected. It's like I am criticizing Biden with the hope that he will fix the things that I actually think, and I could be wrong too, but that I think are mistakes. Or that the Democrats and the left will get their act together. And, you know, uh, you mentioned I had Josh Krausar on on my podcast. You know, he talks about Biden having this like malarkey moment, yeah. which would be kind of a sister soldier moment where Biden stands up to the left. And I kind of feel like he sort of maybe needs to do that. Right. He he went through the entire campaign and, you know, Biden deserves a ton of credit for not taking the bait for not following the crowd, for not supporting, you know, Medicare for all and defund the police. Like Biden was very shrewd, but he also never really confronted the left. And um, and he he won. Right. So it's kind of hard to argue with success. Like he he, kind of kept his head down. He didn't directly confront them, but he managed to win in spite of them. But I just don't know if you can do that for four years. And I do feel like I'm not saying he has to like you know, do a Bill Clinton style takedown of the left. I don't know that he could do that if he wanted to, but may I would be more comforted with a little bit of push if he were to push back a little bit against some of the excesses on the left. See, I think the, the important thing that they need to understand is the the one, I was going to say the one idiot rule, which um, I'm going to have to, you know, pay the price for using the term idiot, but the, the one idiot rule, which is that, you know, you may think that we live in an age in which the president of the United States with his bully pulpit you know, sets the tone and defines his party, but that's not true any longer. You just need one person out there in Colorado who says something wacky or offensive or extreme, and that becomes the face of the Democratic Party for millions of voters. And you know what I mean? I mean, you just do you know, cherry yeah. pick. You know, it's like, what does the, the Democratic Party hates America because Corey Bush said blank or Elon Omar said blank. And so on this issue of crime, this is a problem. Let me read you from uh, Texera's. And again, I'm apologizing again if I mispronounce his name because I respect him tremendously. Um, you know, he says this, this is a big effing deal for the Democrats. I mean, according to recent data from uh, the Democratic oriented Navigator Research, more Americans, including independents and Hispanics, now believe violent crime is a major crisis. Um, they believe that that is a bigger crisis than the coronavirus or other areas of concern. Meanwhile, majorities of even Democrats now believe violent crime is a major crisis and concerns are sky high among black voters. 70% say it's a major crisis. This is, as Biden might put it, a big effing deal. Democrats in competitive races are no doubt looking at data like this and at the Adams race in New York City and taking careful notes. They know they cannot afford to just run on the Biden boom. That's necessary, but not sufficient. And Biden himself has started to address the issue, though it is not yet clear the extent to which he will be able to consolidate the rest of his party around a tough on crime approach. The ideological resistance is likely to be fierce. (laughs) 
But a party that aspires to build a transformational coalition will have to overcome that resistance and base itself firmly on voters' needs and values, not ideology. Now, I, I think that's tough love. I think I agree yeah. with him. But you and I both know how tough that's going to be. Yeah. You know, just because the defund police folks have been humiliated in New York City does not mean they're going to be folding their tents anytime soon. What they need to do is think of, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And, you know, basically what it says is that you can only get around to worrying about self-actualization after your basic needs are met. And so, like, yeah, maybe you care about the cisgendered patriarchy, but you can't really get around to voting on that if you're worried about getting mugged, you know, on yeah, the way to school. This is good. And so I think that's a real problem that, yeah. like, fear is a primal uh, emotion. And, um, and, and, and if enough Americans have fear, they're not going to get around to worrying about, like, the niceties of – gender pronouns or whatever, right? I mean, it's going to look a little silly because you can't even like, you know, you're afraid for your safety or for your wife or for your kids. And like, that's kind of where we're headed in cities right now. Um, and that will trickle down. Uh, and I think it is a real fear. And then the other point that I would make is that there's certain, you know, issues have built in skews, and it's hard to change the way that we these issues skew. And the truth is, like, if we're talking about crime, Republicans are usually winning. If crime is an issue, Republicans are usually going to win more often than they're going to lose. And so really, if Democrats want to win, like, their best strategy is not to ignore crime, but to make it a non-issue by solving it. If, if Democrats can either solve crime or just... Um, or just sort of live off the borrowed capital of Rudy Giuliani's tough on crime policies, yeah. then they can flourish. But but if they can't, if crime becomes an issue again, um, they it, it's very bad news. And I do not think they fully appreciate it. You know, Ezra Klein I, I gets this. Yeah. He's been writing yeah. about this a long time uh, at the New York Times. But but most liberals, I don't think, fully appreciate the power of this. No, I, I, I don't think they do. And I think that they think that if they talk about gun control, that somehow they've addressed the issue, which is uh, not going to work for them. I think it is interesting. I'm starting to hear some voices uh, in the Democratic Party who are beginning to uh, you know raise concerns about bail reform and other things that have you know let loose a lot of very dangerous people on the streets. And I know that runs against the grain, uh, but, it, but if you're in a city like New York, those are the things that were top of mind. Otherwise, how do you explain the result of that, that primary? Um, so let, let's talk about J.D. Vance. I want to switch, switch gears for a moment because you had a, a piece. And I was really struck by, and a lot of people have now written about, you know, and J.D. keeps talking. And, you know, he's, you know, continuing talking about his his evolution from being anti-Trump uh, to being not, not just pro-Trump, but but even Trumpier than Trump. It, it, it's it's like he's, you know, putting on a Trump Trump mask costume. And now he's telling Time magazine that, in fact, he favored uh, Josh Hawley's objection to the Electoral College. So he's all in on on sort of the the big lie and, and everything. And, and you refer to him as sort of the avatar, uh, not sort of, you refer to him as the avatar of corruption in the GOP. So my question to you, Matt, is why J why would J.D. Vance be the avatar? There are so many others who have done this. What makes him stand out in your mind? Well, I think it, it, it kind of goes to the Dan Crenshaw thing, which is to say that he's, um, there, there are some people that, you know, going uh, Trumpy is a logical move for them, right? Like, I'm not sure Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, has the chops to write like a best-selling novel or to make it through in Navy mm -hmm. SEAL boot camp. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I would rather be, if it were me, I would rather be a, a beloved best-selling author of Hillbilly Elegy um, than I would uh, a politician who very well could lose, right? I just, I, I don't get the trade off. I don't I get, don't get the, it either. The, the, the hunger, the desire to be in public. Like, ben Carson, think of the good. Think of the good that Dr. Ben Carson could have done for the pro life movement. Here you have a world famous African American neurologist. He could have just talked about the, the, the dignity of life, 
uh, and really advanced that one issue and and otherwise remained apolitical. He could have been a a rock star, a hero. I mean, my my kid got a book from the library about him, and it was like I forget the blurbs on the back were like. You know, it, it was people like Jesse Jackson <laughs> saying yeah. how great he was. You know, they had a movie about, him, made a movie about him. There are yeah. there are schools here in Milwaukee named after him, and he was a compelling. But I I think I introduced him at two different dinners uh, when he was here, and he was it was a very charismatic figure. I mean, talk about a guy who had a wonderful life and you know incredible respect, incredible prestige, and what did he do with it? And J.D. Vant, I think, is one of those guys. I mean, this is somebody who, you know, Mona Charon has uh, done a better job than me of sort of documenting his rags to riches up, up by his bootstrap story of coming from Appalachia and a very dysfunctional and chaotic environment, joining the Marine Corps, um, that sort of turning his life around. Uh, you know, I, did he go to what? Was it Harvard or you know, yeah, to, Yale Law School? Uh, uh, yeah, it was Yale Law School. Yeah. And, and then, you know, uh, made it big. Uh, you know, financially, and then wrote this really amazing best-selling book uh, that captured the zeitgeist, just the per- the stars aligned, a perfect moment. And now he's doing this, and I, that is why I think he stands out as as someone a little bit different. Because when Trumpism can corrupt and seduce not just the losers who have no, you know, as 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 Richard Gere said, I've got nowhere else to go. He, but but JD Vance does have somewhere else to go. Well, and he did. And, and yet yeah. he still is susceptible to the siren call, you know, of MAGA. That is why I think he stands out. Well, also, I mean, the fact is he had it right back in 2016. In fact, he had a very very distinctive position. He understood the appeal of Trump to a certain group of voters. And he understood their their concerns, their disillusionment. And he was able to articulate that. And that, and that was a moment of real insight on, on his part, to understand who these forgotten Americans were. And that's why he became so big, because he in some ways became the translator of that experience for the rest of America. But he also made the distinction that Trump was the wrong uh, was the wrong answer that he was like injecting heroin to this group that it, that he was that he was uh, that his proposals were either absurd or or corrupt and and so he had a very clear view he was able to distinguish the problem the issues from the man and yet he was not able to sustain that and I guess that's part of the problem he yeah. he, he actually yeah. had a very he had a, a position that he could have and again could have been an important voice. Um, yeah. He could have been a more important voice than even if he were to succeed, which I don't think he's going to, you know, as a junior senator from Ohio. So I don't know whether it's the seduction of, you know, having Peter Thiel, the billionaire, give him $10 million or brokering a meeting with the president in the White House. Maybe that, <laughs> that doesn't in. hurt. <laughs> I mean, if you or I had a Netflix movie, even if it was a shitty movie, we go, OK, you know, this is good. I've got a, I got a, I've got a career path. I guess part yeah. of it is the willingness to engage in self-humiliation. You know, it, it's it's to, you know, bow the knee. And, and then the way he's doing it, that he feels the need to dumb himself down, to go with the most crudely nativist sort of approach. Back in 2016, he, he rejected Trump because he cared about people like immigrants, like Muslims, and he was concerned that Trump made them afraid. And this was this was wrong and it was unchristian and he wasn't going to have it. Well, now he's like all in on all of the Trumpian immigration policies, all of the cruelty, everything. You know, he's he's hanging out with the American greatness crowd. He's buying into the big lie. That's what I, I mean, I understand ambition. What I don't understand is the appetite for self-humiliation. Me too. And I think maybe like uh, we try to come up with with noble reasons why we're not susceptible to this. And it may be that we're just too egotistical and proud that we're not willing to humiliate ourselves. Or maybe they're like sadists or maybe there's a weird like, I don't know, thing going on. But look, I think what makes this, you know, and look, if if J.D. Vance is into that sort of thing, you know, more power to him. Um, The problem is. Because he had such a, a, a refined and sophisticated and, and nuanced take and smart take on Trump and Trumpism and, and the impact 
that, that Trump would actually have on working class whites, right? Like causing them to play the victim card or, to, you know, really uh, to perpetuate their 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 brokenness rather than it was a very unconservative. Trump has a very unconservative message, which is basically you're a victim, you're being taken care of, you should be aggrieved, only I can save you, all those things. So because Vance was such a sophisticated critic of that, and now he has been turned, I think it's even more demoralizing. I mean, imagine if yeah. Maximilian Kolbe or Diedrich Bonhoeffer um, are released you know, from a concentration camp and then swear allegiance yeah. to Hitler and say that, you know, uh, and uh, there, you know, we see these forced confessions, but it's even more dangerous when they're not forced. And the best, let me tell you, the best spoof I've seen on this, Charlie, came from Robbie Suave I saw that. over at, uh, at Reason. And he was linking to a piece about J.D. Vance apologizing for his criticism of Trump. And Suave tweets, quote, it was all right. Everything was all right. The struggle was finished. He had won the victory over himself. He loved Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's in 1984. It's the last, it's, it's, <laughs> it's the last page of 1984. Yeah. It's all right. He'd love Big Brother. And, <laughs> and that's the happiness. You don't have to struggle anymore. You have anymore. to laugh or you cry, you know? Yeah, I know. And that that's that's what, that really did capture, I I think. So let me just switch back to one other issue that we were talking about earlier. Among the things that I find difficult to get my head around, um, I understand ambition. I understand the need to, you know, to, uh, you know, necessarily sometimes be a, a team player or even or even tribal. I'm, I'm willing to. This anti-vax thing is so extraordinary to me because we were talking about how, hey, things are going well, we're living happy lives, you know, none of these things are particularly threatening us. Uh, the vaccine thing does threaten us. I mean, it, it, it has the, the potential to sicken millions of, of Americans. Uh, there's all sorts of, there's children who are not vaccinated or not gonna be vaccinated anytime soon. And it seems, you use the word insane, which I think is better than, I was gonna say irrational, but I, I, I think that, it's worse than irrational what's happening now. This is a life-saving public health issue. And I, I guess I would have assumed at some point that just basic rationality, common sense would dictate that if this saves human lives and if it saves your life, the lives of people you love, lives of people in your community, that you would be in favor of it, or at least that you would not aggressively uh, try to, to try to thwart it. And you're seeing it up and down, including Fox News. And I guess it's kind of pointless now talking about the irresponsibility of Fox News or the Murdochs allowing this to go out because people will die as a result of this. And the people who complain about the shutdowns and the mask mandates and all of those things, you would think that they would recognize the way out of that is the vaccine. And so that, that's, that's where it does feel like it's insane. Yeah. It's really irrational. Yeah. Um, I think that it is insane for, you know, uh, intelligent adults not to do it. I think it's evil yeah, for yeah. politicians to play games and to stoke this for political uh, I, you know, I, political I, I purposes. I agree with you. And by the way, the word evil, uh, you know, needs to be used rarely. But this is – this is going to be something that is this, – this, this will be unforgivable. I mean, we were talking about a little bit before, but you have to forgive certain people for certain votes they take. This is unforgivable. If at this moment, with that Delta variant spreading around the world, that you decide for clicks or whatever, you're going to spread this kind of bullshit. I mean, fuck you. Yeah. No, and I, 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 I was listening to a podcast you did the other day, and somebody on there said, um, you know, uh, Trump was talking about how Trump had this strategy – um, not to do uh, mail-in voting and to demagogue mail-in voting. And, and, and the point was, like, if they had been smarter about it and if they had, like, um, you know, started chall legally challenging mail-in voting earlier, that they could have shut it down. Yes. And, and, but the, the, the thesis there assumes that mail-in voting was always going to hurt Republicans. It might not have. Mail-in voting hurt Republicans because Donald Trump told Republicans not to do mail-in voting. And so I think 
a lot of the problems that Trump has are really, you know, self-inflicted. Uh, and I think this is sort of, you know, one of them, right? I mean, like you were talking about how, you know, if, if I mean, if Trump had owned this, had encouraged masks and had owned Operation Warp Speed, that alone might have <laughs> won the election for him. <laughs> You know, um, you you and I had these conversations even before Trump's nomination. Your book, uh, Too Dumb to Fail, came out. What it came out in twenty fifteen? Yeah. So okay. So the book came out. I it it published January sixteenth, twenty sixteen, which means I turned in you know in October of twenty fifteen. I turned in the manuscript. Yeah. So I mean, the you know when when you were turning in the manuscript, the Republican Party was still at that point going, you know, it's not going to be Trump. It will, but it's not, so, so, something will come up. I mean, somebody will take a stand. I feel we're kind of back there right now that everybody's going, okay, you know, look, it'd be horrible. The guy's completely nuts. He's crazy. I mean, he's, you know, got all this baggage, but, but no one wants to be the one to stand up against because they're hoping that something comes along. I actually think that anti, anti Trump at this point, it, it, they're, the entire strategy and approach comes down to three words, three words, Matt, maybe he'll die. <laughs> because they're not willing to do anything and we're just sort of coasting along. And at this point, you know, short of that, I don't see how he doesn't get the nomination and the Republican party has got to, be, are you serious? I mean, sure. There's 20% that think this is the most wonderful thing in the world, but the, the, the rest of them, I mean, Mitch McConnell's, yes. but he's going to smile and get back on board. And yes, four more years of this shit. I mean, it's I, his for the taking. Yeah. If he wants the nomination, nobody's going to stop him. And everybody's playing this like game that's like someone else will do it right. or hey man don't fr- yeah, you're maybe don't maybe he'll don't, die don't freak out someone else will take care of it yeah. and like no one ever does there'll be a lightning strike or and I Donald don't know. Trump will probably Sharks. outlive everybody yeah. it's like cockroaches oh, right. would survive a nuclear attack like Donald Trump yep. apparently you know he doesn't exercise because he realizes that exercising de- depletes. Your energy. Science, man. Um, Science. And so he, maybe he's right because I do feel like Donald Trump will live for like another 50, 60 years. <laughs> I think it's – so on that on that cheery thought, what else are you watching and looking at uh, this week, Matt Lewis? Well, actually, uh, this was in my wheelhouse. I'm not watching uh, uh, too much. I'm right. So my next column is gonna be about the uh, the vax, the anti-vax, uh, you know, paranoid style on the right. Then I'm gonna write a piece. I don't know if you saw this Kevin Drum blog post. Uh, you know, Kevin Drum is a liberal blogger. He was formerly at Washington Monthly and and formerly at Mother Jones, and he talks about how actually at least in the last 20 years, it has been the left, not the right, but the left that has really pushed the culture war issues and made major gains and and, and sort of accelerated that. So I'm going to, I guess I'm going to take turns. My next two columns, one is going to be sort of a critique of of the right and the other one will be kind of a critique of the left. And and I'm sure by Saturday, everyone's going to hate me again. Well, you're used, so. you're used to being there. So wel- welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome to that particular club, Matt Lewis. Matt, thanks for joining us on the podcast again. Appreciate it very much. Always a pleasure, Charlie. Thank you. And thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow and we will do this all over again. 